So it's my pleasure to have Gideon Qualdo here um, and uh, looking forward to his talk. Gideon has been sort of in and out of our sphere for many years now and uh, is one of the uh, heading up one of the you know few groups in the world that are really looking at intelligence and AGI from a very broad perspective and a long-term perspective. Um, we've been happy to collaborate with uh, Gideon and David in the past with Jeremy, um, an intern, and uh, that led to a publication that was shown at earlier this year, I think, at NASIS, uh, but was published in archive uh, last year. But I'm really looking forward to his talk on on one shot learning and continued learning at the hippocampus. So. Go ahead, Gideon. Thanks a lot, Subutai. Thanks for inviting me. Um, and good to see you all. Um, as you know, I'll be talking about the modeling of the hippocampus and, and neocortex for one-shot learning. And the work that I'm going to talk about is by uh, myself, Abdel Ahmed, and David Rawlinson. And we are from Serenaut. Serenaut is a, an independent research group based in Melbourne, Australia. And we've got a dual goal of understanding animal intelligence and using that understanding to improve machine intelligence um, to solve, basically we wanna solve big problems and we can do that by amplifying the tools that we have. And we've you guys used to be called uh, AGI.io until recently, right? But... Well, actually, yeah, our domain was AGI.io <laughs> and we okay. called ourselves Project AGI. And it was all very confusing. And anyway, we just started <laughs> to rebrand relatively recently. And we're now Serenaut. Sarah okay. meaning like cerebrum or cerebellum, like of the brain. And naught is like an astronaut or a cosmonaut, like a, you know, we're on a journey to understand the mind. Nice, great. Um, although you might argue if you have to explain a name, it's not really doing its job, but <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, Dave and I did our PhDs together a long time ago now, back around 2005 um, in robotics. And we have had an interest in AI ever since. And we started to work together on bio-inspired AI um, back around to, you know, early 2010, 11, and um, published our first paper, which was, an, at a, like, uh, was an inspired by Numenta's HTM. Um, and we assembled a full-time team around 2018. We've got internal collaborations and um, supervised graduate students here in Melbourne from Monash University. And I'm gonna to talk to you about one-shot learning. It may seem like the definition of one-shot learning is obvious, uh, but I wanna delve into it a little bit and develop the ideas a bit further uh, before we go on. So if you, it, as a human or an animal, when you do one-shot learning, you're actually learning about categories as well as specifics. Um, if I draw your attention to the example on the right, it can be a good illustration. So you're not sharing your screen. I've, we've so been we're wondering. Not... Yeah, you're not sharing your screen right now. We, we don't see oh. any slides. So far, this has functioned without slides, but this is the point where I think you need them. <laughs> can you see it now? Yeah, this is good. Yes, we can. This is perfect. You might want to go back and just show the title maybe of your talk. Uh, yeah, that's the yeah, title okay, great. and that's the great authors. Stuff. That's us. <laughs> and our international collaborations and so on. And here we go. So that's why I, I'm looking over at my screen here. So I'm not always looking directly at the camera. Okay, perfect. Um, Thanks. Yeah. So as I said, one shot learning is about categories and specifics. And you probably recognize that figure on the right. That's reproduced from a very famous paper by Lake um, on one shot learning and machine learning. You could, the situation here is that you're learning about a segue for the first time. You've never seen a segue before. You're shown this picture and immediately you can recognize familiar concepts there, like the wheels, the handlebars, um, a bar. And you can recognize that these are familiar concepts assembled in a new configuration. Thereafter, you can recognize which one of those vehicles below it is the segue and which ones aren't. So immediately after one experience, you can generalize to other versions of that segue. Um, and if the one that you saw was very recent or very important, then you would also remember that specific segue itself. Um, but if we are to have an, a memory for episodic learning, meaning that you can remember your life experiences and differentiate them, you also need to be able to 
understand about like you really need to understand about specifics it's not just a bonus um, sort of feature so for example if you have been given this mug on the bottom left and that's your mug with your coffee in it you don't want to confuse it with someone else's coffee um, you need to recognize that that's your mug even under different conditions for example occlusion or different lighting uh, and perspective and so generalization is required for both categorical and instance learning. So if I didn't have an ability for one shot learning and therefore an ability to learn about specifics, I would be able to understand that there are common features of all these different mugs, but I wouldn't be able to identify mine. So I wouldn't get my coffee. And if you told me that Paris was the capital of France, I'd learn a little bit about language, but I wouldn't remember that fact. If I was almost run over by this big red object, uh, well, I'd probably have to be run over by it, almost run over thousands of times before I realized that this is a dangerous occurrence and that that big thing is a bus and then be able to generalize to other such buses. And elaborating even further, memory for specifics underpins memory for singular facts, learning of categories, important experiences and objects, and more broadly, an individual's autobiographical history, which is important for a sense of self and for decision-making. Um, and all of those dot points are all aspects of declarative memory, memory that you can talk about and you're consciously aware of. It seems trivial, why can't you just keep a buffer of every experience you've ever had? But that would become very overwhelming would take a lot of memory and it would still be difficult to generalize. So we need to learn about specifics and about categories, but when you learn about specifics, you need to exaggerate the small differences so that you can tell things apart. Whereas when you're learning about categories, you need to gloss over the similarities and ignore them. The similar needs to become more similar. So they're, they're conflicting capabilities and hard to achieve in a single architecture. In animals, this type of learning is enabled by the uh, interaction between the hippocampus and the neocortex. It's usually called episodic learning, but more generally, it's all declarative knowledge. If you think about it, even semantic knowledge is acquired in the main part through an episodic memory. So it begins as an episodic memory. Um, and that's not to mention how important this interaction between hippocampus and neocortex is for working memory and spatial navigation uh, and, and other areas. So we believe that that interaction is crucial for understanding the neocortex itself because it's so important to laying down memories in the neocortex. The interaction is a key um, and more broadly for animal intelligence. The standard framework, um, as you guys mentioned, you've been discussing uh, the standard framework for um, episodic learning using the hippocampus is called complementary learning systems or CLS for short. Um, it's a biophysically accurate model. It models this, the sub components of the hippocortex, which, which is hippocampus, which is something that's really interesting to us. We believe that you need to go as deep as possible to, um, not as deep as possible, but as deep as necessary to explain the um, emergent behaviors of the system. And so we want to understand the inner workings. The basic idea of complementary learning systems is that you have two complementary systems. The long-term memory, which is the neocortex, learns iteratively. And there's also the fast learning short-term memory of the hippocampus. It learns things immediately and then replays recent and important memories to the neocortex for consolidation and long-term uh, re retaining the memory long-term. And of course, it can't compromise the knowledge that you already have, and that's achieved through interleaved replay. By the way, just jump in at any time with questions or comments, and I'm happy to make this more of a discussion, particularly if you're already familiar with certain areas like CLS. Um, I want to zoom out a little bit and just put CLS in the context of hippocampal modeling in general. Because uh, it's a very wide area and um, given the diverse behaviours that are subserved by the hippocampus, um, the models usually 
fall into one of the three major areas of episodic learning, spatial navigation and associative relational memory. Um, I saw a recent uh, research meeting that you had about Tim Berin's work on the um, Tolman Eichenbaum machine. I think that's interesting to note that it actually one of the rarer models that unifies the different perspectives. Um, CLS is over in the episodic circle, uh, but people like Anna Shapiro have looked at learning associations across episodes. So it also unifies a few perspectives. Um, and of course, there's quite a lot of work using hippocampus inspired ideas to improve reinforcement learning. I won't go into more detail now, but we can come back to this if you're interested. So the animal like learning has been inspiration for work in machine learning on one shot learning. Uh, in particular, the pursuit of more sample efficient learning to ease the reliance on uh, large labeled data sets. Um, there was early work in the, in the two th early 2000s by Fei Fei Li and then Lake, Brennan Lake um, published a paper in 2015, which kind of kickstarted a new interest in one shot learning. He introduced the Omniglot data set um, for this problem. It's a data set of 50 alphabets um, written by people, handwritten alphabets. And uh, I know that you also had a research discussion about one shot learning. So I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but just to recap, the idea of the task is that a training sample is shown and then a, a test set of 20 other um, characters. And the task is to identify which of those test characters is of the same class as the training sample. Um, that task itself is considered to be one shot learning. And so learning to do this or learning an embedding or something like an attentional filter or a metric space is considered to be learning to learn. Um, the problem is predominantly in the literature posed in this way as a, it's basically a matching problem. The, the problem is to find which characters correspond, the ones that are there in front of you. It's not about permanently um, assimilating that knowledge and then having that affect future classification. So we believe that's one of the limitations that it doesn't go far enough in that sense. And um, another area that we believe is a limitation is that they haven't looked at specifics. None of the studies that we're aware of um, do so. So as I've described, the, we believe there's an, it's really important to do categories and specifics or instance learning, and that's not something that's addressed. And in the CLS arc, um, literature, there are many simulations. They, they're always done on synthetic data and the problems are posed as memorize a set of patterns and then see if you can rec recall or retrieve the appropriate pattern given a cue. So that's really another way of doing, that's essentially instance learning or learning about specifics and not learning about categories. Um, so we want to address all of those limitations uh, with an extended version of CLS and extended test suite. And that's what I'm going to talk to you about is two, two projects that attempt to do that. So the first project is an extended version of the Omniglot test, um, looking at categories in specific. The second project is about consolidating that knowledge for the long term. Um, a few words about the modeling approach before I get into the nitty gritty. So um, we, the, the, the internally to the hippocampus, there are functional units, they're referred to as subfields. We want to model those subfields. Um, but as you know, the, uh, as you've published a lot about, um, biological neurons are much more complex than artificial neurons. So we want to abstract away the details of the biological neurons and model them as populations but we do apply learning constraints to make it biologically plausible. Uh, they are that there are no labels provided, only local credit assignment using locally available activation values, um, but we do allow backprop up to two layers. And the reason for that is because um, dendritic computation is thought to be equivalent to two or three layers of an artificial neural network. That's a quick, quick question there. Uh, without labels, uh, how would you do the categorization um, task is because it the, assumed to be a clustering kind of approach or uh, or um, do you do labels right at the end 
the labels aren't um, provided at the time of learning, but they're used to know if the classification is correct. So, okay. you know, the, the, the task is to say which one of those test samples is of the same class as the training sample. You can, you can know if that's definitively correct or not using the label, but only for evaluation. Okay, got it. Yeah, thanks. Um, so this is a depiction of um, CLS and the subfields of the hippocampus. The blue box is the entorhinal cortex. That's considered to be more part of the neocortex it, it's, or long, and long-term memory. It learns iteratively. Um, everything above that's hippocampus. Um, I'll just get my animations going here. <laughs> so uh, I, I just a quick word before I go into those details. The hippocampus, the hippocampus as a whole acts like a type of auto-associative memory. It can recall memorized patterns with partial cue, um, but it does it in a particularly well, and I'll go into the details of how it does that. Um, and another thing, uh, just to orient you with previous kind of more, more well-known um, descriptions of a hippocampus, the entorhinal cortex is where you find grid cells and CA3 and CA1 is where you find place cells. Um, biophysical, biophysiological and um, or electrophysiological and lesion studies show that there's theta rhythms that create an encoding and a retrieval phase. And so that the framework describes it in that way as well. Um, so it's easier to describe first encoding and then retrieval. In encoding, patterns are received from all over the neocortex into the entorhinal cortex, and they, there's a kind of binding into a new conjunction. That activation spreads up through the pattern separation pathway here on the left, through the dentate gyrus. And there's through that pathway, there's increasing lateral inhibition and sparse connectivity. And that results in a very sparse activation depicted here on the top left. By the time the signal reaches CA3. CA3 is an auto-associative memory as well. Um, uh, do you, with the sparsity uh, stuff, so I've heard this before, but do you know how sparse it is? Do you, do you have any sense of the numbers there? I don't know off the top of my head, but Edmund Rolls um, has published several papers on um, a similar description of the hippocampus to the standard CLS framework. Mm -hmm. And he goes into great detail about the number of neurons and the sparsity levels and it's a great resource these papers okay and i'm going to talk about that again in a moment um, i'll come back to that um, and during encoding ca1 is learning to use these sparse um, patterns in ca3 to reconstruct um, the overlapping representations in entorhinal cortex so entorhinal cortex similar observations so similar world sort of experiences will result in similar observations they're overlapping but up in ca3 they're very sparse and non-interfering that's so that you can separate so we think of that as a pseudo symbolic representation and hippocampus is mapping between that overlapping representation to the pseudo symbolic um, version of it and um, well, I'll explain retrieval and then come back to Edmund Rolls. Uh, at the time of retrieval, a subsequent uh, experience is presented to the entorhinal cortex. It's in this case, in this example, it's a different version of the same character. So it's similar and you get a similar representation that results in a cue being um, transmitted to CA3. CA3 can then retrieve the, re the memorized pattern and then CA1 can use that to actually activate the um, entorhinal cortex, reinstate the activation that had been there originally when that um, first character was, was learnt. And then through reciprocal connections with the neocortex, the original activations um, are reinstated throughout. And that can be used for cognition or for consolidation. Um, now, the in the standard framework, the um, all the inputs to CA3 from DG and from EC are Hebbian learning and they're associative learning. We found that that confounds retrieval 
when you have this situation where you have a different version of the same character, when you want to generalize, because the, there's a, because there's slight differences, they're exaggerated up through the pattern separation pathway, and then you don't have a, a viable cue. And so we, what we found we needed to do was to, to develop that a little bit further. And that's where I draw on the work by Rolls, who describes this a very strong um, synaptic connections between DG and CA3 that result in DG driving activation in CA3. And that determines the pattern that's active there. And then EC learns to associate to that pattern. And uh, so- How much of this has been uh, shown experimentally? So the, the statement you just made, um, is, has that been shown experimentally that if you have something very similar like these two characters here that through the DGCA3 pathway they would actually end up as very separate representations? And I don't think that level that of detail, that's, that's um, not speculation, but that's kind of um, extrapolating from the experimental findings. The experimental findings show that um, as I described, the DG drives activation in CA3, that it also that it does this kind of pattern separation. But we, through our experiments um, with simulations, we found that then we couldn't generalize. And, mm -hmm. and so we're extrapolating that, um, that actually you would result in a different um, pattern in DG and it wouldn't be useful for retrieval. But actually the experimental findings, the biological experimental findings do show, according to Rolls, that um, that the DG pathway is used for encoding and EC is more dominant in retrieval. So it's not, it's not binary, but it's more dominant. I think the okay. CLS papers yeah. talk about a similar, similar fact there about the relative strength in the different phases. So the assumption uh, is that with the EC to CA3 pathway, you can, when you say it's involved in retrieval, does that mean you can give it something similar, but, or does it have to be identical to what was stored it can well if you it's the pathway the ec to ca3 pathway that is um that is more dominant in retrieval um, and because there's associative connections there there's an ability to generalize so maybe okay. i'll i'll use that as a segue and get straight into that in terms of our implementation so we use the two-layer feed forward network for that pathway so it's not mm -hmm. actually a subfield itself but it's representing the the synaptic connections with the dendrites in CA3. And it's precisely for that reason, that um, question that you asked. Um, but because it's learning to reinstate or to, to recall the, um, the pattern that was retrieved, we can use the DG pattern as the training signal. So it's a, it's a super, we use do supervised learning and we use the DG as the target output for that supervised learning because it's learning to reproduce a cue that will be able to recall that pattern. Um, DG is a single layer uh, fully connected network. It's, it's initialized with random weights and it's never trained. It has local inhibition and temporal inhibition. So that ensures that you get that kind of pattern separation. And um, similarly we, we, to, to the pattern retrieval pathway, we're using supervised learning for CA1. It's also a two-layer neural network um, and it's learning to reconstruct the um, patterns from EC. So they are the target and the input is CA3. As it's an associative memory, we use the Hopfield network, which is a very well known, one of the first types of neural networks that was directly inspired by biological networks. Um, and EC, well, instead of an EC, we used a vision component. So it, it's a sparse convolutional autoencoder and it represents EC, neocortex, everything. It's, a, the, it's the iteratively learning long-term memory. Um, so what is novel about AHA? Uh, I should say it's called AHA as in artificial hippocampal algorithm. And it's meant to be a play on the fact that you have that aha moment when you recognize something and the, where the hippocampus is involved. Um, so we're modeling populations of neurons and introduce that error-driven learning in that supervised learning here in pattern retrieval um, into the ECCA3 pathway. So just to summarize, the, um, the aha operates by mapping between this observational space to a symbolic space. 
um, through separation and completion. And those two pathways are unified in the common representational space of CA3. Um, yeah. Oh, the other aspect of it is it's about compositionality. It's learning these new combinations of concepts or and using them as primitives to build new composite concepts. I can just just to um, illustrate that that's like the segue example I gave at the beginning. You recognize there's um, two wheels and they're used in a new combination. Um, for characters in the Omniglot, it's like there's an edge and a line and a dot and there I can I can learn quickly because I already know those concepts and I'm but I'm learning a new way to put them together. <clears throat> so in few shot learning in general in the in in the literature, um, the training and testing framework is slightly different. So I just quickly uh, go into that. Um, it starts off with a pre-training stage. So that long-term memory learns the concepts that are then used compositionally, and that happens over multiple epochs. After that, there's the evaluation stage where the one-shot learning occurs. And um, a training, training uh, symbol is shown, or character is shown. Um, that's learnt, in our case, it's learnt by the short-term memory. And then when the test samples are shown, the short-term memory needs to retrieve the appropriate matching symbol. Sorry, I keep saying symbol. I mean um, sample or character. And if it's the same one, or if it's the correct one, then it's considered to be correct. So what do I mean by the correct one? Well, it's a nearest neighbor lookup using uh, similarity metric. In this case, we use MSE, mean square error. We compare to two baselines. The first one is the LTM alone. And that is actually the um, naive solution that I mentioned earlier. It, if, you, if you want to do instance learning, surely all you need to do is keep a buffer and do kind of a nearest neighbor lookup over the, to find the most similar ones between test and, set and training. Um, so it's equivalent, and it helps us to answer that question. Does a short-term, a complementary short-term memory, as described by CLS, actually help? Um, and we also compare to FASTNN, which is an alternative STM, short-term memory. We use a standard ML component, but optimized for the task. It's just a two-layer feed-forward network. Uh, and this addresses the question, if, uh, if a short-term memory does help, does it have to be a hippocampal architecture? Or can you achieve the same thing with a more simple approach instead of having all those different you know, heterogeneous architecture, which is much more complex and difficult to implement? And we applied it to an extended version of the Omniglot benchmark. We added the instance classification test. It's essentially the same, but instead of showing different characters, we show different exemplars of the same class. And here's an example with the character Pi. You can see that some of them are really very similar and not trivial to tell apart. And we also added corruption to the images to make it more challenging. Since there's a whole short-term memory, we're also able to learn the whole training set and in one go and then assess the test set rather than doing it one training sample at a time, like most approaches. So question about the corruption that seems a little bit at odds with the instance learning, right? If, is the idea that if you're recognizing, you, you should be able to recognize a specific instance of a class independent of noise. Yeah, yeah. Is that That's, right? So, so, so noise is a type of, uh, is a type of variation that it should learn to ignore ideally, but other variations, uh, maybe more structured noise or, something should, should be considered as being uh, maybe uh, a different instance of the class or you know, of another class. So there seems to be like a, uh, maybe a trade-off or, or uh, you know, issue there to, to consider. That's exactly right. Um, and that's what I was trying to illustrate. <laughs> maybe I shouldn't have gone back so far. But um, with this example, you need to be able to recognize both the categorical membership of an object, as well as the specifics of it under observational variation. So like you could consider this other segue as observational variation, but likewise, you could consider occlusion or lighting as observational variation. 
And you got to try to do do both at the same time and maintain an ability mm -hmm. to differentiate. Does that does that kind of address what you're saying, or did I miss something? Yeah, it seems like there's some sort of a prior on you know types of variations that are that it should no matter what you should be invariant to, even for the very specific uh, case. And I think your earlier example that's a good one. I'd, I'd forgotten about that. Uh, you know, lighting and occlusion and so on. Yeah, and well, it's a, yeah. it's exactly like what we're trying to achieve with the noise, as yeah. you put it. Um, so here's some qualitative um, results to show you, to show the, give you a feel for what's happening in the network as the signals propagate throughout. So the top row is the training samples, and then the next row are the DG outputs, the highly sparse non-interfering um, representations. The next row are the test samples, and um, below that is the queue that's presented to CA3. So that's through the pattern retrieval pathway. And it's quite messy and uh, imprecise, but it is a good cue for retrieving from CA3 the appropriate memory, a sharp version of a memory, even if it's incorrect, it's a sharp, crisp version. And, and that can be also seen in the re the recall, the ultimate recall from the, um, the pattern mapping pathway from CA1 um, in those <coughs> images at the bottom. In most cases, they match the training sample that was memorized originally. And I, I draw your attention to a couple of the places where there were errors in the red circles at the bottom. Um, it's interesting to note that they're understandable mistakes. You can identify with them. So for column eight, you know, it's curvy at the bottom and there's a dot in the middle. Uh, so it's an appropriate mistake. And this is what it looks like when there's occlusion. A lot of the characters, the test characters, uh, whole topological features are removed. I'm looking at column two, uh, but nevertheless, it recalls the appropriate character. And this is what it looks like when there's noise, some examples. Uh, instance classification, and again, with occlusion, um, in most cases, still able to retrieve. Uh, and these are the, the quantitative results. The graphs show the accuracy, and from left to right, you've got increasing corruption, either occlusion or noise. Um, we measured the accuracy using two different parts of the hippocampus to find which part, like to, to understand the relative contribution of the different signals and components. The two that are shown here are CA3 in and CA3 out. So again, the Q and the retrieved pattern. And it was interesting to note that the Q, which was that messy version, was actually more effective. Um, it's arguably got more information in there. Um, whereas the retrieve version, it's like it's made an opinion, it's had an opinion about what it's recognized, and then you lose the other kind of hypotheses, you know, if you want. Um, so the green e um, line here is fast NN, and the yellow one is the better version of the hippocampus. And you, they both have an advantage over almost all the conditions. And between them, the hippocampus is better in most cases, uh, either slightly or significantly. So what we learned from that is that having a short-term memory does improve over a long-term memory. And if you and within that, the hippocampal version is superior. So would this work if occlusions were black instead of white? Uh, I noticed the occlusions were sort of you know, taking away pixels from the original objects rather than, you know, adding a black a, a black circle, for example. I guess you have noise, uh, so that's additive. But what if what about kind of a structured, you know, black occlusion? It's a good question. Um, haven't tried it, but I hypothesize that it shouldn't make a difference because inherently there's a pattern completion. Um, capability occurring. And that actually happens not just through CA3. CA3 is usually considered to be the um, nucleus of 
pattern completion in the hippocampus. But we found that a lot of completion is occurring in the pattern retrieval pathway in the retrieval of the Q. And then CA3 kind of puts the icing on the cake and makes it a crisp version of it. But because there's retrieval over observational variation and completion, I think it should work anyway. Um, there'll be probably technical issues just in terms of absolute values um, affecting the way that those components work, but they're kind of like tech, little minor technical issues that you need to work through. Can I ask a question? Um, when I was observing there, I was seeing that uh, wasn't so much seeing pattern completion. I was seeing this is the closest match. And even those pieces have dropped on out, we find this closest match. Could you kind of elaborate on what you're actually doing as far as pattern completion, kind of like fill in in other contexts, uh, what, what the mechanism is for that? Um, I'll go back to the architecture. It's, um, Pattern completion in the sense that you could have in this, this learn, um, this is the character that's learned here in the bottom left. Mm -hmm. And subsequently you could be shown the same thing, but with half of it obscured or missing. Mm -hmm. Or in a, another version of that is adding noise or just giving a different version of the character is, it's, is a form of providing that variation or missing information. And then it retrieves the original memorized version. So it's considered to be pattern completion and it occurs through, through multiple um, parts of the network. It's firstly through pattern retrieval through the synaptic connections between EC and CA3. And it's also because CA3 is an auto associative memory and um, auto associative memory that that's, they've got a lot, well, in this case, there's a lot of reciprocal connections so if part of your pattern is active, through the learnt reciprocal connections, you reinstate the, the other parts of the pattern and therefore you get a complete version of it. And then there's also completion occurring in CA1 because it's taking the Q, sorry, the, not the Q in this case. Well, it's, it is a type of Q, but it's taking the input that it's learnt to use to reconstruct the, a full version of the output and it's, um, it's doing so. So I think that all parts of that retrieval are responsible for completion. Okay, so I guess another context I've heard of this referred to as hallucination. Do you think this is a mechanism? I mean, not in the grand sense, but just being able to uh, complete the missing pieces and therefore you know, infer what, what is missing. So you're saying that this is a mechanism that allows you to do that. Yeah, it does. It's, it is hallucination in the sense that at least in this version of it, it's going to only be able to hallucinate exact versions of the things that it's seen, rather than use an imagination to invent new, new versions. But I, I think that, well, it's known the hippocampus is involved in prospection. That is like episodic imagining a future, future episodes. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's certainly involved. I think it's the binding of different um, con concepts into new concepts. That, that it plays a part in that, but we can't account for that with this framework. Okay, thank you. Um, and we can- By the way, Gideon, uh, uh, you know, your messages are actually showing up on screen. So you may wanna, uh, I don't know if you wanna show those or you may wanna turn off your notifications. I thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> I, I can't do it now, hang on. You can stop sharing if you want. And... There okay. we go. There you go. Yeah. Sorry. That's all right. Didn't um, we also compared to the state of the art approaches to one-shot learning, they've only been um, applied to uh, classification of categories and without image corruption. Uh, but it was in that case, it was comparable with um, the state of the art approaches that don't use uh, strong inductive priors. Um, so we're comparing basically to the simple ComNet and others. You can see the LTM plus AHA in the top right there, 86.4%. And another aspect of 
one shot learning that we consider to be important is an ability to recall, uh, as I've been talking about, retrieving those memorized samples. And that's what's shown here. You can see the recall loss, so lower is better. It's just the MSE difference between the retrieved and, and memorized sample. Um, in most cases, a high is better than just the straightforward fast NN. Um, and if you look at the qualitative nature of it, fast NN is recalling a combination of memories and they're kind of superimposed over each other. You can see that um, on each of the graphs, there's examples shown fast NN is on the lower, lower side, a high is above. And in all cases, a high is retrieving those crisp versions. And that's the reason why in some cases, particularly for the categories and um, at high levels of corruption, the recall loss actually becomes superior in fast NN. It's a little bit misleading. It's superior because it's got that overlap of all those characters. So it's always a little bit right. Whereas a high is making a, a definite, having an opinion about which one it's recalled and it might be wrong. So but that can also be seen as an advantage in some circumstances. So I now we'll talk about project two. I'll just do this quickly because I know I've taken a lot of time already. Um, just a reminder, this was about consolidation. It was very much a preliminary study and it's a segue into continual learning. Um, because we wanted to have a, a clear task for the long-term memory that we can show that we could, we wanted to find out if we could improve it with that consolidation we created a classification task and added a single layer neural network with a softmax to be a classifier. And we modified AHA by duplicating CA1 so that it reproduces both an image and a label that's then used for training. Um, the, we kept that concept of runs of 20 training and test samples, but in this case added 19, well, there's 19 previously seen samples and we added one unseen novel class that needs to be learned in one shot. We added a pre-training step for that long-term memory and classifier to learn um, those 19. Uh, in the first phase, STM memorizes in one shot the new batch of 19 seen and one unseen. And immediately those, those uh, samples can be recalled and used for short-term inference. Then there's a consolidation phase and that's spontaneous it's not triggered from anything externally and we do a phase of random replay where the memories are randomly replayed to ltm and this goes back to your question about hallucination because we trigger that by by just feeding noise into the to the hippocampus and it comes back with um with clear samples we did have to get it um, going through the hippocampus more than once before it kind of um so it retrieves an incomplete version and then we feed that in again and get a more complete version. Um, and th that's analogous to big loop recurrence, which is uh, something that is spoken about. This also occurs. You've got recurrence internally, but you also have, um, remember I was saying the hippocampus as a whole acts as an auto-associated memory. The, the inputs to EC um, result in re um, reinstatement of the activations back on EC, and then they go through the hippocampus again. That's big loop recurrence. So you get it to dream. Yeah, in a sense. Dreaming about the things it knows, and that's replayed to the classifier, which learns. And um, so have a look at the results on the right-hand side. The accuracy with the short-term inference was boosted from 45 to 74.5%, so a very dramatic increase. Um, after consolidation, when using the long-term memory alone, the accuracy dropped and it was a much more modest improvement over the baseline, but still significant. And it didn't compromise looking at the left-hand side. It didn't compromise accuracy on um, the previously learned knowledge. So in conclusion, we found that um, extending CLS with that error-driven learning in the perforant pathway does improve it in the sense that it's able to generalize on spatial inputs. And we were able to use in inputs that are grounded in sensor data rather than synthetic vectors. Um, and using a hippocampal algorithm does improve one-shot learning, in particular to learning specifics and with image corruption. 
Uh, and then through consolidation mechanism inspired by hippocampus, we're able to um, affect permanent weight adaptation so that it also, that knowledge is, is retained and used for future. And we want to then now extend the work to continual learning, which we've started working on, um, and continue to improve the model itself to account for more hippocampal um, phenomena. So that's, uh, yeah, that's the presentation. Have you got any further questions? Thanks, Gideon, that was great. Uh, any questions from other people? Maybe I'll have a, I'll ask a question. Yeah. Is that similar to the account you have of CLS that you've discussed previously? Uh, Karan, what do you think? Uh, it, it is, but I think you went into a lot more detail about how it, um, about the different parts that you were showing the dentate gyrus and all the different components and how they're interacting with the entorhinal cortex. We didn't go into that much detail about it. We just covered a very, um, the high level idea of what, what, of why CLS theory is even being used in, in a continual learning setting. So um, way, way more detail from you. Um, and, and what about, I know you've had discussions about one-shot learning. Is it, um, you know, what, what are your thoughts on, on the field of one-shot learning and the challenges that they have? Who was it that talked about one-shot learning? Uh, you had a recent research meeting about it. Um, maybe uh, Lucas might have, we, we, we've talked a little bit about few-shot learning, uh, looking at kind of mammal and some of the meta-learning approaches and um, we use that mostly as a way to kind of get up to speed on meta-learning. Mm -hmm. um, and meta-learning has, has then been applied to continual learning with OML and animals yeah. as, as well. Yeah. 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 Yeah, we've been looking at continual learning a lot. Um, and what's been really interesting is that there is virtually nothing on few, continual few shot learning. And uh, that's an area where replay methods like this might really come into their own and be important um, as opposed to other methods for, for continual learning. Mm -hmm. You mentioned kind of the capacity issue and that's something I was wondering about as well when you were talking about what is what are your assumptions about you know the capacity of the buffer or the replay uh, you know the amount of data that has to be remembered to uh, you know to, to um, for continued learning to, to work you have to uh, pretty much have a, a history of everything that you've learned so far or is it uh, sufficient to have a small sample of subset of what you've learned so far I think looking at the biological model, it's clear that we don't have a, a huge uh, capacity. Most people remember you know, a couple of days and um, that's probably sufficient time to consolidate the important memories and retain them for long-term. So I expect the same phenomena to map across to continual learning. Um, if you're learning 200 classes, maybe you only need to remember the previous four um, a window of four of them as you continue to learn. Um, it's going to have to be something that's much smaller than the, the total for it to be yeah. a benefit. Yeah. But that's not something you've modeled uh, currently. Uh, we, well, we have. We've started working on continual learning and we're keeping a, a buffer of the last two support sets and we mm -hmm. showed some benefit. Um, but, uh, you know, it's early. That's really early days. Um, yeah, so we're actually, have you seen the paper by Antonio? Um, they do continual few shot learning and they, they didn't actually develop any novel algorithms yet, but they compared standard one shot learning to a continual learning framework. And so we've used that framework uh, with our version of AHA. Um, and in that case, we we're using two, uh, like I said, a buffer of two um, support sets. And it did give a small advantage. I mean, it gave a big advantage, but small compared to the other methods. So we need to look forward <laughs> to it. Which paper is that again? You said Antonio? Um, I'll tell you. It's called Defining Benchmarks for Continual Few-Shot Learning. Oh, and it's yeah. by 
Andreas Antonio. I think we did talk about this paper. Uh, Gideon, I, I don't have a question. I just, <laughs> actually, it's a meta question. So uh, my, my two o'clock meeting went very late, so I joined almost at the end. Do you mind if, uh, can I, I, I'm gonna have to watch the recording and can I get back to you if uh, you have any questions later as well or? Oh, of course, yeah. Okay. Just uh, ping me, my email is. Um, well, I, I, can, mean, I, I can forward your email to later. everyone as well. But okay. that's the, they're the contact details. Oh, there we go. Right. Yeah. Thanks. I had a question. So uh, we've been talking a lot about uh, replay, and uh, and I think there's been this um, um, this ongoing debate about you know to like to what extent are you doing replay and not just retraining the model on um, on data from a certain um, task in, in when you're in a continual learning setup. But I think um, you know what you've shown here is that it's almost like it's it's very analogous to um, a sleep phase where that this data somehow gets consolidated. So is there for you when you think of replay? Is there a boundary between okay, you know, when we have a generative model that's um, mimicking data from something that the model that the learner has already seen? Is that um, you can do that, but not like explicitly show it data? that it was previously trained on? Is, um, is, is there a boundary there? So with this, again, with this framework, all it can do is replay what's been learned exactly. Um, but other people have done work um, using a GAN to learn from small data. And then, well, not, it's actually not small data, it's still big data, but it's able to um, then generate novel samples to train the, the long-term memory on the task. Um, so that's kind of just very loosely inspired by hippocampus and doesn't try to understand how the hippocampus works itself. Um, so I'm interested in figuring out how the hippocampus can be used to, in a biophysically accurate way to actually do that. To, to, but the, the question remains, like, is that how, as biological organisms, how we consolidate knowledge? Is it by, is it by generating novel samples or is it simply by... Um, repeating what we already experienced. So I, I would want to understand that better and then, and then pending that, figure out if it's necessary to do it or not. So in the, in, if it's the latter case where it's just repeating samples, that means that um, neocortex would be memorizing examples exactly and then uh, replaying that to the hippocampus, is that right? Uh, the other way around, yeah, the hippocampus would be replaying to neocortex. Okay, got it. Um, but what's really interesting about replay is it's not just for consolidation. It's also, you know, in the short term, that information is in the hippocampus and it can be replayed for um, cognition and in working memory. And there's some really interesting experiments um, I saw recently by uh, El Niv and others have done it as well where they show replay being used for a working memory task. It's like, so it's actually essential for many processes of cognition. It's not just consolidation of, to long-term memory. Um, and the prefrontal cortex is, is forming task-specific representations that are then remembered by the hippocampus and replayed at the appropriate times. And this is all during a, a single session. There's no sleep involved in, in between or any sort of consolidation. Exactly, yeah, exactly right. Is yeah. that right? Huh. Yeah. yeah. And, but you, you, as you know, the hippocampus can retain, working memories usually relates to memory that you retain over moments for a task, whereas hippocampus is a longer duration. So there's all these different durations and, and, um, component regions of the brain that are interacting to give rise to the kind of behaviors and memory that we experience. So it's kind of, I think it's important to remember that the, um, the definitions are useful phenomenologically, but they have, they have limitations. M meaning that any, any definition is, is, is too limiting if you take it um, too uh, literally. Mm -hmm. 
Can you give a sense of the the size of here, the different of the networks of the various networks? How how many units? Uh, you know, what is the size of the vectors, the representation vectors, and and you know, even in this in the sparsity, what what are what are the numbers that you're dealing with? Um, in the biological case, you mean? Or no, in in your network, in your implementation. Um. Well, it's, it was pretty small, actually, relatively speaking. Um, these are actual image from the, from the dentate gyrus. So you can see the level of sparsity there. I think uh, 10, it was um, about 250 um, units and a sparse with 10 active units. Um, the pattern retrieval pathway, we had about 800 units in the hidden layer. Mm -hmm. um, the sparse convolutional autoencoder was about 128 filters from memory. Okay, and, um, and just one layer? In just one layer, yeah. Yeah, so it's very modest compared to deep learning systems. Mm -hmm. um, the, so the hop field network is the same size as the DG because it's taking those patterns one to one yeah. and memorizing them. And it's also a single layer with recurrent weights. They're the only weights that are learned are the recurrent weights. And they're only learned yeah. for that for that set that's being memorized. Yeah. And um, I can't remember what we did for CA1. It was a little while back, but it was it was the same size or smaller than pattern retrieval. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, I just wonder with the 250 unit hot field network, are you going to get, you know, the, the capacity and the, I'm not sure what flavor of hot field networks you're using, but uh, typically capacity is a big issue with, with hot field networks. Yeah. So. Yeah, we use the pseudo inverse learning rule just because it was more convenient than the heavy in learning rule. And we know that it's roughly equivalent. So it's, you know, it's, we know that it's possible to do it with heavy in and we want to be biologically mm -hmm. plausible, but we allowed the pseudo inverse. Um, and it also leads to a higher capacity. There's been a lot of research in Hopfield, like there's kind of been a, re a recent like increase in yeah. interest and yeah. people have published versions that have a much better capacity and also do some abstraction um, as well. In particular, I'm thinking of there was a deep mind paper where they showed that you can modify a standard network to make it auto-associative. And um, so we, it, that's one of the research directions we wanna go in is to improve the capacity and look into what's the best way to do that and how can we do that in a biologically plausible way, um, as well as introducing sparsity into the different components, um, partly so that we can continue to learn. Cause this was all batch based, which is a big right. limitation. We wanna make it, um, properly continuous. Could I ask you to go to the slide where you were talking about, uh, uh, what was the word, uh, compositionality? Sure. I think there were a few. So um, were you talking so, about that one? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> so when you say symbolic conjunction of primitives, are, are you meaning conjunction in in what sense just 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 oring things together or you're thinking that there could be some more complex operation for aggregating things uh, no just binding together that these uh, different underlying concepts are co-occurring in the case of omniglot characters it's literally you know the the, the vision component mm -hmm. is finding features like edges and circles mm -hmm. and it's literally saying these different visual components have occurred together. So and is it like a new combination is a concept by in, its, in itself. And the one shot learning all the that's why the one shot learning is able to be sample efficient, because all you're learning is about the combination rather than about learning the, the underlying features. Okay, so I, I think that just short circuit the question I was about to ask because it's when you when you mentioned that it almost sounded like a bag of features whose relationships to each other was that important but you're saying it's really something else um i'm sorry i'm not sure i followed uh there's there's a um, 
lookup uh, technique uh, where they talk about bag of features. You don't care as long as you find these features there. You don't care what the relationship is to each uh -huh. other. It's like a uh -huh. you know a gross dictionary lookup. I got these keys, and you know yep. as long as all those keys are present, trigger. But it sounds like uh, when I initially heard you talk about uh, uh, what the conjunction actually looked like, I thought, well, maybe that's as long as it has these aggregate features, but the relationship to each other has to be somehow important because otherwise those symbols would all jumble to each other. So, um, but then you said it wasn't feature based. So then I, my, uh, that's why I said it's kind of short circuited my question. Yeah, I think the position will be important because you end up, it's convolutional, but you end up with a volume, then right. the position is important. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of like when I, I think of if the thing can be distorted, as long as it has this, these features and relative relationships to each other, it still could somehow go through the network if it, uh, you know, it, you, you used occlusion as one example, but, you know, any, any sort of distortion or affine remapping or something like that theoretically could go through too. So I'm, I'm not sure you're, you're set up to be that general or whether, you know, that's, that would be, there would have to be an augmentation to what you already put together. Mm -hmm. No, the, the position is important. Okay. Okay. Well, cool. any more questions? Gideon? No? Okay, well, thank you so much, Gideon, for uh, accommodating us and, and uh, giving this presentation. I'll send your email around to everyone and uh, I'll let them uh, either answer any other, ask any other questions that they might have. Sounds great. Look forward yeah. to uh, hearing from people. Yeah, thank you so Thanks much. much. Thanks so much. Right, uh, Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, say hi to David for me. I will. I'll pass it on. All right. Take care. Bye. Bye.